Hi everyone, I'm Kathleen McElroy. I'm the Associate Director of the School of Journalism here. Um, Moody College is, uh, is so ecstatic about having this talk. Um, Richard Harris um, has written a book on a topic that's very much in the news. Um, if you read the New York Times Magazine, I think a couple of weeks ago, they um, did a whole cover story on the reproducibility project. And it's the idea of can science be reproduced? Reproduce, or is this one study just a phenomenon in and of itself? The very first line of the book he just produced, Rigor Mortis, and how sloppy science creates worthless cures, crushes hope, and wastes billions. He writes, when you read about advances in medicine, it often seems like long-awaited breakthroughs are just around the corner for cancer, Alzheimer's, stroke, osteoarthritis, and countless less common diseases. But it turns out we live in a world with an awful lot of corners. So I like this idea that we've been waiting for these breakthroughs, waiting for these breakthroughs. What happens when it seems like this isn't really happening at the pace we think it should happen? So I am very, very pleased. And to have Richard Harris here, and I want to thank the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Kavli Foundation for making this AAS AAAS Kavli Science Journalism Award lecture possible. Now, this is important also because AAAS is having its big convention here in Austin in February. So science and science journalism is all in the news and it's going to be around us. Also, really want to thank the Kavli um, Science Journalism Award lecture series. It allows us to have people, distinguished journalists like Richard Harris here. These awards were established in 1945, and they've gone to some of the most notable writers in the United States, including Rachel Carson and Isaac Asimov. If you're an undergraduate, you may need to Google those names. <laughs> but I suggest you do, OK? Rachel Carson and Isaac Asimov actually worked with um, one of his relatives. The Kavli Foundation endowed the awards in 2009 and doubled its commitment in 2015 opening the contest to journalists around the world. And I think that's particularly important because we now know what happens in Malaysia, what happens anywhere is affecting us. We need to be less United States centric, even though some of our officials may feel otherwise. Richard Harris, tonight's speaker, has won the AAAS Kavli Award three times for his work at NPR, including a series in 2010 about the blown out B, uh, BP oil well in the Gulf of Mexico spewed far more oil than the officials had actually estimated. He's traveled to seven continents for NPR, including this cool photo where you're shown by the icebreaker. I don't know if that's in the Antarctic. He's um, been Timbuktu, South Pole, Galapagos Islands, Beijing, doing SARS, you're a brave man, the center of Greenland, Amazon rainforest, all kinds of good stuff. Um, in 2014, his focus shifted from an emphasis on climate change and the environment to biomedical research. And as I said, his recent book is Rigor Mortis, How Sloppy Science Creates Worthless Cures, Crushes Hope, and Wastes Billions. There's some flyers around. Don't just sign them, have me sign them, but actually pay attention to what the flyers say. So his talk this evening is titled, Bad Science, Good Science covering medical research. Welcome, Richard. Um, so yeah, so uh, I will give you a, we have a clock and everything, so that's good. I will give you a, a brief tour of bad science, good science, and, and sort of how my thinking has evolved on covering science since I uh, was asked to come back and cover this topic a couple of years ago and ended up writing a book on the topic. Now, I'm going to start with a cartoon that's 20 years old but is still uh, meaningful today. This is a, the random medical news. You spin this wheel and you say coffee. It can cause depression in uh, 
twins. Uh, so according to a, r a report released today, he says, and then they spin the, the dial. But we, who hasn't had this phenomenon, felt this phenomenon where basically every day it's some other, some other disease, some other thing, and it's either good for you or bad for you and whatnot. And, and why does this happen? Uh, and and that's, that's a good question. And what part of the reason it happens is because science keeps changing and evolving and improving. If you've heard of CRISPR, that's a new technology that allows incredibly precise gene editing. And it replaces some technologies that did that pretty well, but not so well. And this paper that was published uh, earlier this year uh, reports that scientists are realizing when they did the same experiment with this more precise and, and effective tool, they got different results than when they'd done it before. So it's like, OK, out with the old and in with the new. But it also means a lot of the research that they'd done previously wasn't giving them the results they actually thought they, they had. So that's one thing. Technology always changes. Science changes. Science is a process, right? And we, get, we improve things and we get deeper understanding. Another reason this happens is science is full of bias. Uh, we, it's a human endeavor the way everything else is. Our lives are full of bias. We all have confirmation bias. We seek out information that, that supports our point of view. And we tend to downplay things that don't. And so this is a paper that was published a couple years ago. And they just and John Ioannidis and his colleague decided to look through the literature and see how many different kinds of biases are mentioned in the biomedical literature. And they came up with 235 different kinds of bias that, that scientists report, which means and any of these things can, can mess up your, your, the way you interpret your experiment. If you haven't, for example, been careful to blind your experiment so you don't know whether you're looking at the, the experimental set of animals or the control set of experiments, you're, uh, you, can, you can fool yourself into, getting, uh, into thinking you have one result when, in fact, you don't, or when you have a different result. And the confirmation bias, all sorts of other biases crop it up in the literature. And actually, science. Richard Feynman, who's a famous physicist, uh, gave a, a commencement talk at his uh, university where he was teaching Caltech some years ago, and said, basically, what science is really all about is, is a set of, of principles to prevent you from fooling yourself. And he said, and you are the easiest person to fool. So, so, so reducing bias is a, a fundamental part of science. So here's another problem. Uh, this is another paper, same author, actually. Uh, this is an essay he wrote some years ago. Uh, why most published research findings are false. It's like, how can you say that? And the answer is, well, some people said, well, they didn't entirely buy the argument. But his argument is that so many experiments are small uh, that the effects that they see, if you repeat the experiment, actually wouldn't show up again. But scientists don't often repeat those experiments. And they actually don't understand the statistics that go into the experiment. So they, there's, in, in science, there's this whole cult of the p-value. And if a p-value is less than 0.05, which is 5%, then scientists say, OK, it's a real result. It means, and, they, and some people misinterpret that to mean there's only a 5% chance that it's wrong and a 95% chance that it's real. That's actually a very poor interpretation of what p-value is. But a lot of people do that. A lot of people run these kinds of studies. And so as a result, he argues, that particularly small studies, the vast majority of small studies, if you repeated them again, you would find out actually they, they don't hold up. And so this is another argument that, that there's, a, there's some misunderstanding about how to interpret results once you have them. Uh, so this paper really caught my attention. This was published in 2012. And when I started my new beat at NPR uh, on biomedical research, I came across this paper. This, this speaks to how big a problem this is. Uh, and, in, in, and there are more than a million papers published every year in the biomedical literature. So, so we, we, there's no way to check and see what, how reliable that entire literature is. But Glenn Begley, who was the head of cancer research at a drug company called Amgen, decided he wanted to look at papers he really cared about, papers that were published in the literature that had come from academic labs. And he wanted to know he, whether they were correct. Because if they were correct, they were important potential leads for new cancer drugs. And so he found. He went and he dug up 53 of these papers that had crossed his transom over the years. He'd been at Amgen for 10 years when he did this work. Uh, and he said, how many of them can we reproduce in our labs? If we try to do the ex same experiment, do we get the same result? Uh, and he, he tried, and he, he did not have very much luck at all. So he took some of these experiments back to the original researchers and said, I'm having trouble reproducing these experiments. Would you do it for me? Can we come and watch and see how you do the experiment? And even the original researchers very often couldn't reproduce their own results. And in the end, of these 53 studies he looked at, he could only get six to reproduce. That's, what, 11%? And uh, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty low success rate. There was another paper that was published uh, around the same time from scientists at the drug company Bayer. 
and they found that they could reproduce 25% of the papers uh, that they were really interested in. So this led people to be concerned about, wow, how reliable is the biomedical literature? How much can, in fact, be reproduced? And I must say that this paper itself is not reproducible because he didn't say what the 53 papers were. So nobody can go and check his work and see if he was right. And it's possible that some of his failures were his fault, not the fault of the original paper. So we don't, so that's another important lesson. It's not easy to tell even if you try and fail. You don't know who, necessarily which one is right and which is wrong until, until time elapses. Uh, so this is a, a problem that uh, is not just in biomedicine. This is a paper that came out in science a little while ago. Uh, uh, and this paper looked at uh, reproducibility in the psychological sciences. And Kathleen mentioned um, the article in the New York Times Magazine about a social scientist named Amy Cuddy who had done some work. She had basically, she has the second most popular TED talk on, uh, on the planet. And she basically had, makes this argument that if you do these power poses, I don't, I don't know what they are, but, uh, but basically it makes you not only more, uh, more focused and energetic, but it actually changes your hormone balances. So actually it does make you more powerful if you do these power poses. And she ran into trouble. It turns out that her findings were not reproducible. And in fact, when somebody did a bigger and more careful study, they didn't see those results at all. But uh, that is actually, uh, but she was actually following the general rules of the psychological literature of how psychology experiments are run. And it turns out they're run to a fairly low standard because this was a paper that tried to reproduce 100 uh, studies that they sort of picked because they were interested in the 100 studies to see whether they could reproduce them. This was another group of people that, and uh, talked to the original researchers and said, if we try it this way, would you expect, it's not an identical experiment, but would you expect that we should get the same result? And of those, only about a third of them uh, were able to be reproduced. And, and some of them, about another third of them were actually uh, came to the opposite conclusion. A lot of them were just kind of muddled. It was like, well, it might be something, but it, it's not a significant result. And, and so, so, it's a, so this, this, this paper made a lot of headlines as well about the, raising questions about the reproducibility of, of the psychological literature. Uh, this is a, another example of, uh, of just sort of a tap tap on the shoulder. You, how many of you have heard these stories about a new gene for, for uh, schizophrenia has been discovered, right? We've heard many of these over the year. In fact, oops, these guys went and looked at 25 genes that have been published, and it's like, oh, here's a gene that's associated with schizophrenia. And they went back and took another look, and they said, actually, on further reflection, none of these 25 genes has anything to do with schizophrenia. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> um, now, how, how often does this creep into journalism? And this is a, a question that actually some academics have taken on. Estelle dumont Malay and her colleagues at the University of Bordeaux uh, published this uh, analysis earlier this year. Uh, and what they did was they started out looking at 100 English or 200 English language newspapers from around the world and dug through them to see what its scientific breakthroughs, particularly in medicine, were announced in these, in these uh, newspapers. Things like a, an association between a particular pesticide and Parkinson's disease, for example. Or there was one uh, paper they looked at that was reported a new mechanism to explain ADHD. And, uh, and they said, well, let's find out how many of those actually stood the test of time, because these were all, you know, a lot of them were initial studies, sort of suggestive stuff, the kinds of stuff that grabs headlines. Uh, but what happens as science continues to chew away at those, uh, at those topics? What happens? And they found 156 of them that had, um, where there had been enough information accumulated about the topic over the years that scientists could go back and do what's called a meta-analysis. They could gather all of the published data together and do one big analysis and sort of imitate what it would look like if they'd done one big study in, instead of a bunch of little ones. And they found that when they looked at these 156 studies, the papers, uh, uh, there were about half of them uh, showed that the, the, the findings stood up over, and over, the test of, gave over the test of time. And only about 34 of the most exciting percent of the most exciting ones actually uh, stood up. So it's like if you have a particularly exciting finding, you have like maybe a one in three chance that it's actually going to stand up uh, upon review by, by, by further science. And do we as journalists report the, oh, by the way, that, 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 that what we said about Parkinson's disease and pesticides, that turned out not to be true? 
Now, we actually do a pretty poor job of following up on that, partly because the initial studies are published in big journals where they get a lot of attention and so on, and then the follow-up studies tend to get published in smaller journals that journalists don't have the wherewithal to, to dig through and find out. So, so we may not even realize uh, that a lot of the things we've reported on turn out not to be true down the line. Uh, and it's also kind of weird if you think about it to do a, a story that says, hey, remember that story that uh, we published six years ago? Probably not. But, well, it turns out it wasn't true. Thanks very much, you know. <laughs> so, so, so there's some, there's some uh, other reasons why we don't report those. But it's important to remember that those are often uh, dodgy s studies. So this all led up to last year, Nature decided to say, you know, ask scientists themselves. So is there a reproducibility crisis in, in science? And, they, and they, this is of all, all sorts of scientists they asked. 52% yes, there's a significant crisis. Another 38% said yes, there's a slight crisis. I'm not sure what a slight crisis is, but it was a, a lot of people like that answer. And 10% said, uh, I'm washing the dishes, I don't have time to answer your question, or I have no idea, or whatever. But the point is that this is an idea that has really taken hold, in, in particularly in the biomedical community, but elsewhere, that there is actually a crisis of reproducibility. I argue there's actually not really a crisis. I, there's not something new that's happened that's just cropped up. And we're, uh, but I think what we're seeing is a, a realization that science is a lot less reliable uh, on a, if you're looking at the tiny granular level of study by study by study. It's a lot less reliable than we have understood. And we need to be much more cautious in interpreting any single um, result. And, and, and the world of science also needs to think about ways to improve the reliability of these individual stories and or studies. And I, and I will talk about that a little bit before I get to what journalists can do as well. So uh, not only does the general uh, p p pile of scientists agree this is a problem, but uh, Francis Collins, who is the head of the National Institutes of Health, to much to his credit when he saw these issues emerging, instead of just sweeping them under the rug, he said, yeah, we have to deal with these issues. This is, you know, I'm the steward of $30 billion a year of taxpayer money. And if we have problems, we have to figure out what they are and how to fix them. And this is a quote from a paper he wrote with uh, his chief deputy, Larry Tabak. And he, he explains, in the long run, science is self-correcting. That's the beauty of science, right? The scientific process is trial and error. You find things. Eventually, the truth sort of filters out. But he says, but in the shorter term, the checks and balances that once ensured scientific fidelity have been hobbled. Pretty strong words from the head of the National Institutes of Health, right? So at any rate, uh, but after sort of getting that general uh, gestalt, I decided, OK, I'm going to write a book about it. So I took a year off, and, I, and, and thus was born uh, Rigor Mortis. Uh, actually, my preferred title, my working title for the book was Science Friction, because <laughs> the idea being that these are, these are problems that are slowing down the prog progress of science. Science isn't dead, as, or rigor in science isn't dead, as Mortis might suggest, but, but, but science is, is, is suffering from, uh, from needless friction, and my book explores ways to deal with that friction, to, 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 to uh, minimize it so science can move ahead faster. So what are the causes of, of this? Well, bad ingredients uh, in, are, in biomedical research are quite common. Uh, designs that are susceptible to bias crop up more than you would care to believe. Statistical errors are another really big problem. And the funding pressures and sort of the underlying culture of science, because the NIH budget doubled between 1998 and 2003, which created like a huge outpouring of new science buildings and a whole bunch of hiring in the sciences. And then since that time, over the following decade, in, in real spending power, uh, Congress said, okay, we've done enough, NIH, well, let's turn our attention to something else. And in spending power, uh, the funding decreased by about 20%. So all of a sudden, you build up this whole new enterprise, and then you start to starve it. So, so that creates a bunch of incentives that, that, that drive scientists to do things that are, they have to do to keep their careers going, uh, but it's not in the best interest of science. So this is a, a photograph of Henrietta Lacks, who uh, uh, in 1951 was diagnosed with cervical cancer. She was at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. and. Uh, and she, um, the, the, the doctors there were able for the very first time to isolate some cervical cancer cells from her uh, and keep them alive and perpetuating indefinitely in, uh, in, in a Petri dish. And uh, uh, she's, uh, I don't know if you uh, saw the uh, Oprah Winfrey show about her or if you read yeah. Rebecca Skloot's wonderful book about the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks, which was the title of her book. 
But her, her cells became this incredibly useful uh, laboratory tool because they keep growing and growing and growing. And anyone who wants to study cervical cancer in particular, or sometimes just cancer in general, uh, can get her cells and use them. And the problem is uh, that her cells have taken over the world. They're, they've turned out to be sort of the kudzu of the biomedical world because they grow so well, so much better than any other cell, that they're an easy contaminant. And they're very frequently moved from one uh, set of, of uh, uh, petri dishes or whatever to another, and before you know it, you know, scientists thinking they're working on one kind of cancer is actually work, has actually had their cancer cells overtaken by these HeLa cells, and, and they're actually just studying this, um, this immortal line of, of HeLa cells. And it's a huge problem. Uh, this paper, published just a couple weeks ago, took a look at how big a problem it is. How it's, you know, how cell line misidentification identification contaminates the scientific literature, and these guys went back and they said how many different uh, cell lines there are uh, th that are called one thing are actually HeLa cells. And they identified, there, there are well over 100 different cell lines that are called uh, one thing but are actually HeLa. And, they, and that what they discovered was that in the scientific literature, just for a, a, not a complete search, but a, 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 their one swipe across the scientific literature, they found 32,000 papers that were published that were using HeLa cells where the scientists themselves thought they were studying liver or some other kind of cancer. And then they said, how many people cited these 32,000 papers? And they found half a million papers in the scientific literature uh, that did that. And that's just one kind of bad cell line. Uh, this is the, uh, the International Cell Line Authentication Committee. And they've cataloged more than 400 misidentified cell lines. Uh, Wish is actually HeLa, Chang liver is actually HeLa, intestine 407 is HeLa, but a lot of these are other, are completely different things. MDB4, uh, MDA and B435 was isolated um, at MD Anderson, and it was been, it's been used for many years as a breast cancer cell line, but it turns out that very early on it was contaminated with a, a melanoma, and people today continue to publish these and call them breast cancer cells, even though it's pretty clear from, the, from, from research that it's actually a melanoma cell. Uh, and when that was, since that was discovered in around the year 2000, there have been 900 publications call, you know, of this cell line calling it breast cancer when it's pretty clear it's not. So this is a problem that, uh, that you know, needs to be shaken. <laughs> the biomedical uh, uh, researchers need to be much more attuned to this problem, and they're starting to become aware of that. And I'll have more to say about that in a minute. This is a, a man named Tom Murphy. I met when I was doing some of my early reporting, as I was sort of exploring the new world of, of biomedical research in, in 2016, new to me, uh, he had been diagnosed with uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, which is a terrible uh, muscle wasting disease. And eventually, in just a couple of years, four years usually uh, after diagnosis, uh, you, you die from this disease and there's no treatment for it, no effective treatment. There's one approved drug that has a marginal benefit. But he uh, was told by his doctor, you could get on a, on a drug trial. You could try something. We, there's a couple of options for you, and you can see if an experimental drug is going to help you. And he decided to sign up for a drug trial uh, studying a drug called DEX. Uh, and uh, he got on the drug trial. It actually, he actually said it made him feel better, but uh, overall, when they, when they looked at the thousand people who were on, on this drug trial, it turns out that it really wasn't helping them. And so they, they, they said, oops, this is, this is not working. Sorry. And it was yet another long list of failures for ALS. And this is a, a, a paper that you don't have to look at all the details, but the blue lines represent um, scientists who had been tr trying to develop these drugs. These were all ALS drugs. And the blue lines represented their initial reason why they thought this could be a good drug to study in human beings. Because these blue lines show how much survival increased in mice when they were given this, these various drugs. And you can see some of them seem to do a pretty good job in, in improving survival in mice. This was his drug, Dex, here. And it was, had some marginal, uh, some, some improvement in the mice, which encouraged them to try it in humans. But uh, this group called ALS TDI decided to take a close look at this data and see why none of these worked if all this mouse study seemed to suggest that it would. And the first thing they found was that many of these mouse studies were very poorly done. They may have had six or 10 mice only in these studies, a very small number. Uh, people weren't careful to do some really basic things, like if you have, uh, if, you're, if you're studying a, a experimental drug in mice you should take, make sure that when you're randomizing your animals into one group or another that you, you break up the litter mate so you don't have all the 
pups from one litter in one group and all the pups from another litter in another group, because then the difference might just be between litters as opposed to uh, in the drug. And so these guys said, let's do a, all these studies again and do them correctly with large numbers of mice and following all of these uh, necessary things to avoid in inadvertent bias in these studies. And when they did them again, that's what the, oops, that's what the black bars show. Basically, none of them really worked. And, um, and, uh, and the, the, the catch was each one of those experiments cost several hundred thousand dollars. And, if you're an ac and these guys had the money to do it, but if you're an academic researcher interested in ALS, it's really hard to get that kind of money to do an experiment. So, so you would just try, you know, you'd just say, well, I can do it with 10 animals, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get these, these sort of results and cross my fingers, call it a pilot study, and hope that the pilot study actu actually represents what is, uh, what's really going on. But, uh, but that's, you know, that's, again, part of the... Uh, part of the problem that we're facing in biomedicine in this country, that there's you know, so, so many people chasing a, a, a shrinking pool of dollars. It's, it makes it difficult to do the science the right way, the way it should be. So that's a, an example of experimental design. Let me talk about some of the statistical problems that crop up frequently. And this is an idea that's called harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. And this doesn't seem like that big a deal when you think about it, you do an experiment, you, you're trying to f see if this drug is going to affect heart disease or whatever, and it doesn't really seem to affect heart disease, but then you look over here and say, oh, look, all these people, uh, uh, there's a re reduction in cancer in one group of patients, of one particular kind of cancer. Wow, maybe, the, you know, and publish a paper saying this drug reduces the risk of cancer. It sounds kind of innocuous, but it's actually a very bad idea. <laughs> and, to, and, uh, and to explain why, I've, I have found this cartoon just a couple weeks ago in my... Uh, Newspaper. Oh, I see it's copyrighted 2012, but it was just ran in my newspaper a couple weeks ago. But here's the hypothesis, the scientist uh, firing off her hypothesis and off to see what her results are. And, uh, and she <laughs> that's basically what harking is. After you know what your results are, then you say, that was my target all along, right? So that's the problem. And, and, uh, and this happens very frequently in science. It's still valuable to make those observations, but then you shouldn't, you shouldn't say, this data support my hypothesis, you say, this data give me an idea to, for a new hypothesis that I now have to go out and test and, and do it correctly. Otherwise, uh, you could just be doing, you could play, be playing these kinds of games. Uh, scientists themselves are finding that in this hyper-competitive environment, uh, they are more and more inclined to, to, to talk to talk up their, their, their research because their tenure may depend upon it, new funding may depend upon it. This is a study that looked at language in, in scientific papers between 1974 and 2014, just to look at how much hyperbole the scientists themselves were adding uh, to, their, uh, uh, to their papers as a way of measuring how much of science itself is sort of being driven by this, this hype, this need to prove that I've got the latest, greatest, whatever thing in order to get my next grant and so on, and the temptation to sort of exaggerate results as opposed to saying, this is an interesting result, but I don't want to go too far. No, the, nowadays it's like, uh, they, the, the words robust, novel, innovative, and unprecedented uh, increased in relative frequency up to 15,000%, which is itself a little bit of hyperbole, right? 15,000%. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but the point is that the scientists themselves are trapped in this system, and they themselves are, are, are hyping their own work, and that's something that we as journalists have to be very aware of uh, as we talk to them as well. Um, in terms of the sort of the cultural issues that the, all this causes, there, I, I mean, there, there's lots to be said, but I will just touch on a comment from Henry Bourne, who's retired at UC San Francisco. Uh, and in his view, the real problem in this hyper-competitive environment is scientists are having trouble balancing ambition and delight. That you need ambition, you need to keep food on the table, you need to keep your lab going. Many scientists feel like, if I can't get a grant, I may have to lay off my graduate students. They're feeling a huge amount of pressure in this very competitive environment. And universities used to support be heavily supported by states. They are much less these days. State money is, is dwindling, and so scientists are more and more dependent, and research is more and more dependent on getting federal grants, and that creates this incredible pressure on scientists. And what he says is, uh, scientists should be driven by delight of understanding the, how the world works and, 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 under, and, and driven by their own curiosity, but instead, uh, uh, the balance is off and they're driven by too much ambition, not just because they are personally, you know, uh, out to, to for, for, for riches and fortune, but just the, you have to be uh, ambitious just to keep your lab alive. And that's a, that's a really difficult situation for scientists to be in.
So what are the solutions? Well, one thing is to validate in your ingredients. And, and the, oops, oops, I thought I had another slide in there. Uh, and, oh, I, actually I do. Um, uh, and this is Carolyn Compton, who uh, is a pathologist at the University of Arizona. She was uh, up at the National Cancer Institute for many years. And what she, and, uh, and what she argues is that a lot, of, for, a lot of samples being gathered in pathology, uh, for pathology use in surgeries and so on, end up being put into science as a way of, of studying uh, basic biology of disease. So somebody who has colon cancer operation, a little piece of colon cancer is removed from their colon, that tissue may go immediately into, into preservative or so on, or it may sit around for hours or even days before it actually gets treated correctly. And that variability is a huge problem for, uh, for scientists to then look at that tissue and say, this is what colon cancer looks like. It's like, well, this is what this particular sample collected this way looked like. But she, so she's been trying to get pathologists and emerges, or surgers, surgeons and so on to collect these tissues with great care and uniformity so that they actually are comparable. Another, uh, another um, thing that the NIH is doing is it's now insisting that, that scientists validate their cell lines. So those kinds of HeLa problems we hope will eventually be uh, brought uh, under control. Scientists say, you know, now when they have their grants are, are told that they're expected to do that, they have to find the money to send out their materials to get them tested. The checks and balances are just, that whole system is just getting up to speed, so there's probably still a lot of uh, problems in the system. But ultimately, scientists are at least now on notice being told you have to validate your cell lines to make sure that you're using the cells you think you're using. Transparency is another very important way of dealing with this. And, uh, and one, one feeling is that if you have uh, scientists know that they have to put their data out for other scientists to look at and the computer code that they use to analyze their data, that, that they will be uh, there will be a checks and balances on that, and, and scientists will realize, I better be sure I'm right. I, if, I, I've got, if I've got mistakes in my data, I want to find them, and I don't, want, I don't want to put them out for other people to find. So transparency as an idea of, not of preventing errors necessarily, but of, of speeding up this process of the self-correcting nature of science. If, you know, the sooner those problems are discovered, the better off you are, because then you don't have people running down a bunch of blind alleys. So this is just one small example, this is a group uh, in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, that's got this open science framework, and they are encouraging scientists to dump all of their data into it, and, and it's sort of a big data sharing system that they're encouraging scientists to use. I'm not sure it'll succeed because it seems like many scientists think it's more work to do it that way than the old-fashioned way, but, uh, but they're pushing, they're trying to find ways to get people uh, to, um, to, to be more transparent with their data and their processing, and, uh, the processes that they use to analyze it. Better training is also important. In, in biomedicine, very often scientists just learn, graduate students and postdocs, learn from the people who run in their labs. And uh, their mentors may or may not have a lot of time to do that. In fact, many mentors spend most of their time writing grant proposals these days because money is so short and, every, and you have to write seven grant proposals to get one grant typically. So it's a, so, uh, and the, the training in, in, in this preclinical research tends to be fairly thin and, uh, and so, the NIH in uh, 2014 sent out a proposal saying to all of the requests for information to universities across the country saying, who's got the best training classes so we can uh, share that in those ideas, that information in this kind of training people how to do these kinds of preclinical biomedical studies. And they, and they got essentially no answers. No one was actually, no one had a really strong course in, in training people how to do that. So the NIH is now funding some development of some of those courses. I encountered this wonderful guy named Arturo Casa Deval, uh, who's at Johns Hopkins, and he's decided that, he's, that he wants to sp spend his focus getting scientists to think much more carefully about, about these issues, thinking about how to design an experiment. He says, so often if scientists get an experiment and they can't understand the results, the first thing they'll do is run a second experiment. He says, people should stop and think and, uh, and be, you know, it, a PhD has the word philosophy in it, right? He, he says he wants to bring the, the philosophy back into this world so that, so that um, you can bring more knowledge and information out of an experiment and not just say, oh, that one didn't work, I'm gonna try something else, and really try to think about where you're going with your experiments. Um, and finally, changing the culture of science is, is, is the, a big challenge. You have to somehow rather figure out how to break the cycle of the hyper-competitive environment driving scientists to publish flashy papers that may not be right and, and 
and they need to do that in order to get their tenure and their grants and so on. So that's a, that's a, a big pr problem to solve, but ultimately culture can change and it does change, but it changes slowly. And there are also people thinking about how to make that happen. Uh, I wanna say just a couple words. This is actually, a, this was at the National Academy of Sciences earlier this year, uh, a, a colloquium on reproducibility of, of research uh, issues and proposed remedies. And a lot of people were talking about some of these things at that, and I just wanted to focus on one guy named Trevor Butterworth who runs an outfit called Sense About Science, and he was arguing that we really should make sure that journalists understand much better about w where all the pitfalls are in, in, in science so that they can cover science much more carefully and they can get it right. And I stood up after his talk and I said, I mean, I can correctly report what some scientist has put in the literature, but uh, but I'd like to remind you that a lot of what's in the literature isn't right. So it's not just on me as the reporter, it's on the peer review and all the, 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 the entire scientific process to be more careful and more thoughtful about how they put science out there. I mean, we also have a responsibility to portray it correctly, and, uh, and that's where I would like to end. Uh, what we can do, the first thing, is don't assume. Don't assume that what you're reading is right uh, just because it's published, even if it's published in a peer reviewed journal, which is of course what we're always, we're all, first question we're always asked is, was it, was it peer reviewed? Yes, y yes. Even if it's peer reviewed, it doesn't mean it's correct. Second thing you should do is ask questions. Are there other studies like this? Because uh, science doesn't r usually proceed from just single outstanding weird experiments, but it's accumulation of, of data. So are there a bunch of other studies? Where does this fit in? Is this the first one of 10 that found this result? Or does this support the results of nine other studies like this. Another question is, are the statistical findings barely significant? Is it sort of really close to that magic p-value of 0.05? And if it is, there's actually a much higher probability that the paper is wrong than the scientists themselves even realize. So if you see those kinds of p-values in a paper, uh, and you have to learn how to read a paper to find those p-values, but it's, a, it's, it's a something even a, uh, some, something you can, you can pick up. Um, you know, that is, um, if that's a, a, a red flag for me, if, if the p-values are barely f at that mark, it's like this doesn't seem like a very robust finding. And then, you know, do, are there other findings in the literature that contradict the result? If so, that could be interesting to explain why. Every study is different, looks at things in a little bit different way. Why are there, why are there conflicting results? And um, I think it's also really important on us to express uncertainty when we're reporting on things and not just say, here's the newest finding, coffee causes wrinkles or coffee doesn't cause wrinkles, whatever. Uh, we, we need to do the best we can to convey to our audiences that, that science is a gradual process, that it, you know, each piece is just one more piece of the puzzle, right? More than a million papers published every single year. Think of how much science is going on all the time and what tiny increments it's coming out in. And we shouldn't oversell any one particular finding. There are occasions where one finding is spectacular. There are you know, these, these eureka discoveries that we report and they, are, and they are worth reporting, but those are fairly few and far between and we should recognize that that's not the everyday kind of science reporting, but that's a pretty unusual occurrence when you can say, wow, we now know that the universe is expanding at an accelerating rate or something like that. These things don't happen very much. Um, if the effect is small, you should say so. If, and this is, a this is a tricky business in biomedical research because sometimes scientists kind of bury this information. They don't, they say, oh, this is a 40% increase or whatever. And 40%, uh, if, if you actually dig down to the original numbers, 40% may mean little or nothing. Uh, and particularly if it's a small study to begin with, it could be the difference of two or three people. And if you just had results different in a small number of people, you could have had a completely different conclusion from a paper. So sometimes you have to look in the supplementary of uh, parts of the paper, unfortunately, to find out how many people they studied and how big the effects are. But it's worth your while to dig down and find those things because percentages are a pretty poor way. You know, if, it, if you're, if you, have a, you know, if it's one in a million ch chance of something happening and that increases by 50%, it's like a two in a million chance of something happening. It's still not something you have to really lie awake worrying about, right? So, or if that affects doubles, that's. Let me get my statistics right. Mm -hmm. Check your math. Never do math in public, actually. That's, a, that's another rule that I just violated. Um, the point is, uh, look, at the, look at the raw numbers. That will, that, will really, uh, that will really help you tell the story and understand what's really going on. Because scientists might be you know, using some of those robust and, and extraordinary words in their abstracts, and their findings may not actually support that particularly well. 
And finally, follow up. You know, look back from time to time on big stories that you that uh, uh, and see if they're panning out. In fact, there was a uh, paper that came out just a couple of weeks ago um, looking at uh, engineering uh, human embryos using this technology called CRISPR. And, the, and there's a lot of news coverage about it and very, a lot of excitement about it. I've started to see bubbling around in, the, in, the, in sort of the, the area where scientists chit chat online that there's a lot of concerns now about whether that science actually uh, produced what, what the initial report was. Oh, did, did this engineering really happen? What, you know, is this a really robust result? So if I were covering that story, I would say, hmm, I gotta, I gotta keep an eye on that because that may turn out not to be true. That was, a bi that was certainly a big splash. That's something that if it turns out not to be true, we should follow up on. So, you know, following whether it's Twitter or blogs or there are various places where, where scientists talk about these things. There's something called a pub peer, which if you're actually getting deep into this, into this world, it's a really handy thing to know about. It's basically a, a place where scientists go and, and if they have a concern or a question or whatever about a particular paper, they'll, they'll, they'll publish uh, a note on pub peer and they can do it anonymously, which is both helpful and dangerous. Uh, because they, they may be going after somebody they don't like or they may, uh, or they may be afraid to speak up in front of uh, some powerful person in, in the world of science where they inhabit. But you, know, you have to be careful. You don't really know necessarily what those anonymous critiques actually mean. But pub peer is a great place to go uh, to, to sort of hear, hear, the, hear the chatter about a particular paper in the scientific literature. So uh, just a, a, a tip on, on those points. So at any rate, you know, these are, these, are, these are problems we can't solve as journalists, but these are problems that we can address, we can be aware of, and we can use, some, uh, and we can use a bunch of techniques uh, to make sure that we're not overselling things, that scientists aren't overselling things, and that, you know, and that we're keeping in perspective that, you know, how science is actually built. It's, you know, piece by piece, small step by small step, and we, we need to find creative ways of telling dramatic stories about small steps. It's a challenge that we all face, but I think that's what we need to do. So. Thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take questions. And there are, there are microphones here, and, the, uh, uh, and since this is being recorded, if you have a question, please come down to a microphone. Hello, my name is Sahar Shmace, and I'm a second year journalism student. Um, I recently did a story about alternate methods to CRISPR, and um, I find science very, very fascinating, but I'm not ever going to be smart enough to be a scientist. So I was just wondering how would a journalist approach uh, doing scientific reporting when they find themselves to be kind of like not able to understand the actual scientific research? Yeah, that's hard. And, and uh, I, the first thing I would say is talk to as many people as you can and fact check as much as you can the, what you've, ri you've written. Uh, I, uh, one of the great journal science journalists of all time is a guy named David Perlman who's 98 and he just retired this year from the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, and I, I have crossed paths with him many times over the years. And what, one question he asked at press conferences that I always thought was tremendous was he, he would stand up and say, let me make sure I understand this. And he would put something into his own words and ask the scientist, Am I getting this right? Mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, I do this all the time when I'm doing phone interviews. What I liked about the fact that Dave was doing that was he was sort of the dean of science journalism in the Bay Area. And a lot of people who were, had less experience than could, in the audience could hear that. And, and it's like a question that, that anyone should ask. And people n didn't necessarily ask because they felt like, I'm going to sound dumb if I ask that question. You, you, can't, you have to get away from that, that idea. But if, but if you end up with a story that you're not really sure about, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't press send on that, on that story. I think if, you, if it's gonna take a lot of work to get there, take the work, or, or at least start out with a simpler uh, story that you have more confidence you can get right. I don't think it does anyone a service for you to put something out and cross your fingers and say, I hope I got that right. So, so yeah, but if you can t you know, find people who can help you explain these things. I mean, over the years, I've developed a long list of people that I know in all sorts of fields, so I can call them up and say, I'm having trouble untangling this. You know? Who should I talk to? Those kinds of questions. And that's, that's, those are just basic skills of journalism, no matter wh whether it's science or business or anything else, you, you need to do that. But yeah, it's good to know what you don't know also, because that, that's really important. If you think you've got it all 
you know, or, or close enough or whatever. Uh, that's sometimes we're actually, the, that's where kind of I make mistakes. It's like, oh, I know the answer to that and I'm not double checking those things. And those are, the, those are easy pitfalls even for very experienced reporters. So, so just a, that's a, a, a couple of ideas of how to proceed. But yeah, you chose the, the alternative CRISPR technologies is a particularly tough story for anyone to tell. And I, <laughs> I give you kudos for, for taking that on. Thank you. I actually got to speak with, um, with uh, George uh, Church, Church, the yeah. person who actually conducted the That's alternate experiments. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he he spoke with me in a way where he broke things down, mm -hmm. but it was still very difficult after watching the lecture because of all of the terminology. So it's kind of uh, yeah what threw me off. And it's wonderful to find a scientist like that who can really explain and break things down because many scientists can't. And by the way, sometimes when scientists can't break things down, it's because they don't really understand it very thoroughly <laughs> themselves. Honestly, <laughs> scientists like they're they're sort of comfortable in their little bubble, their little world of jargon. And if you say step out of your world of jargon, sometimes they just can't because they haven't they haven't thought more broadly about it. We need them too. So, I I, I try, tend to say thanks for your time, and I go find somebody like George Church who actually can do that uh, with with great skill. But uh, it's you know sometimes it's a treasure hunt to find persons like that. So, Thank you. I I have a question. Please come to the microphone. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm an old journalism professor, and now here's my question. I, how do you, what would your tips be for understanding a scientific journal article? You mentioned you should look at the p-value, but what are other tips? Because I think sometimes a lot of people don't go to the original source, they just rely on the press release from the university. Right. Um, it's a, it's a tricky one. I think that it really helps to have a scientific background to do this because if you don't, you're going to get you're going to get lost. Honestly, I think you're not going to be able to read a paper if you don't really understand the nuts and bolts of how of how science works. Uh, and I I often get even lost in jargon because every field has its own specific jargon, and you sometimes have to really struggle to understand. You know, I may know the general the ideas in a paper and so on, but I'll come across a word. It's like what what does that mean? Uh, but, but my recommendation is certainly the best science journalists do try to read an entire paper. I may skip over the methods section a little bit, but uh, sometimes at my peril. Sometimes, there, sometimes I have a question that I know I want answered that's going to be in the methods section. I want to know how many people are involved. I want to know how good the statistics are. I want to know, uh, you know, the abstract sort of lays out what the results are. But the introduction often provides the context that I like to know in order to understand why do I care about this? Where does it fit into other science? Because often in the introductory part of a scientific paper, they'll say, there's been this dispute over all these years, and now we have the answer finally. You know, uh, or uh, we have this, this new advance that, that helps, that we argue supports this hypothesis over that hypothesis. And so that helps me frame my own story about what, the, what it's about. The other thing I do often uh, when I'm use looking at a scientific paper is, if I'm not sure exactly, who all the right people are in the field, which I often don't. Um, I will look in the, in the references because often in those introductory parts, they'll refer to the big review papers or other big findings that have sort of led up to this moment. And then I look to see who wrote that and it's like, oh, I'm gonna call that person. And often they, they, they talk to the people who disagree or they, they cite the people who disagree. And so I wanna talk to them as well and say, okay, so now do you believe this or now do you accept that this, this, this question has been answered? So those, so those references, I look carefully at the footnotes, uh, of particularly of those, one, of those cases to find other people to talk to about those papers. So those are a few tips. Okay. So are there um, any other questions? Well, thank you. Yes, there's a question. Oh. Hi, my name is Evelyn Moreno, and I'm a fourth-year journalism student. Um, for NPR, you do like three to four minute or sometimes a little bit longer segments. So I was wondering how you take something so complex, sometimes research and stuff, and put it into those segments, and how you make sure that you're conveying new information in each session, and also making sure not to lose people's interest, because I'm always very in tune, because you go from one thing to the next. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is the art of radio, and I uh, it's, it's, what I, it's what I like, and what also drives me crazy is having three or four minutes to tell a story. Uh, but I, I consider it a, a challenge for me, just the way I want to find a scientist who can explain sort of big picture simply. It's like, I know that I need to do that for a story. I, need not, I, I can't afford to get lost in the details and just dump a lot of details on people and hope they can figure it out. 
I need to have a really clear idea of what the story is. A radio story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It actually is, even though it's three or four minutes, it, a good radio story is structured much, like a, much more like a magazine story, because you know if people are going to start paying attention at the beginning, unlike a newspaper article, you can expect they'll listen to the end, unless they click off the radio because they're disgusted with what, you're, what, what they're hearing. But that's an advantage of a, of, a, of a radio story, is you can have that, that narrative arc. And I think that's one way to hold people's attention. That's why at the beginning of a, an interview, I'll say, why, did you, why, why do you care about this? Why did you think about this topic or whatever? Uh, what got you interested in this? And then s the scientists themselves start telling stories. And so, I Im so uh, the, the challenge is to embed the information in a story of, of, of discovery and exploration by the scientists. Uh, I try to avoid numbers as much as possible because people can't remember very many numbers. I have this sort of funny test that I use. Uh, I ask myself, how much of this will somebody remember in three days from now? And then I say, and how much will they remember the New York Times story three days from now? It's like, I, I, bet, I bet we're about the same. So even though I have much less real estate to work with, I think it, that I have the potential at least to capture the emotion of the human voice and to do, to, to do some storytelling and so on, to have something that's as, that has as much stickiness mm -hmm. as a longer article in a newspaper would have. Right. Thank you. Here's a question. I'm Larissa Harold, and I am actually not a journalism student. I'm an environmental engineering student. Um, and so I'm kind of, I guess, asking almost the converse of some of the questions we've had before, like if um, I have an interest in journalism and writing, and so if I want to be able to communicate my what I might find or work on in the future, like what could I do to kind of transfer those skills almost the reverse direction? Yeah, well, I think... Uh, the first thing you need to do is think about the language you use, because I think scientists easily, or anyone in a technical field gets lost in their own jargon. It's very handy, right? It's a shortcut. It's a really easy way to communicate with other people who speak the same language. But the first challenge is to step back from that and say, how would I explain this to somebody who's not in my field? And, and people who spend a lot of time just thinking with it, about these problems from, from within that narrower context can sometimes find it very difficult to find that, that broader language. But it, I think that finding that language helps also helps you think more broadly about the context because it's you know and 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 if you can find that language then you can also explain why you care about it why it matters to the world I mean who cares I mean that's a question that uh, that in, that you should be able to answer if somebody says who cares or you should actually before you have somebody <laughs> ask that question you should give an answer why you should care so that's one thing you can do but I and I think that's the most important thing really is just think about what language you use to to explain what you're doing and, and recognizing that you're talking to somebody who's, you know, presumably smart but doesn't have the language, doesn't have the context that you have. And yep, that's the challenge. Okay, thank you. People can line up for the mic. You don't have to wait for someone. Okay. So Yes, I'll do the conclusion from here. Thank you very much. This was fascinating. Um, you explained science and science journalism in ways that were so clear that we could all understand it. So thank you very much. And thank you, AAAS and the Cavalier Foundation um, Journalism Award Lecture Series for this. This has been awesome. Let's give them a hand. Thanks for your attention.